Welcome. My name is Josh Wolf. I'm a developer advocate at Comunda, and today I'm doing a deep dive into the ZB Go client. And Falco may join me at some point during this investigation. It's like um, 6 a.m. in the morning, I think, in Berlin. Yeah, 6 a.m. in the morning in Berlin. But I'm going to go ahead and get started now. And then we can wait for um, whoa, Inception. Um, you know, see if Falco shows up. Okay. So let me move this over here so that we can see this window. The ZB Go client. I'm using IntelliJ's GoLand as my IDE here. So let's have a look. This is in the uh, in the ZB repository. So it's um, inside the ZB repository, you have two clients, the Java client and the Go client, both maintained by the same core engineering team that maintains the broker. So they have a very good integration and they're always up to date. Go.mod, let's have a look. What's this gonna do? Okay, let's have a look. We got package internal cmd okay so the zbctl um command line client is also found in the same part of the repo the zb um, repository clients go internal package commands entities pb worker zbc commands well let's have a look at zbc first client.go Probably don't need this uh, terminal. So let's have a look. Start at the top. Goodbye. Now I wonder why this is giving me these uh, errors here. We'll, we'll find out about that in a second. Okay, default request timeout is a constant set to 15 seconds. This is quite, uh, this is a very useful way to do it. Default keep alive, 45 seconds. Interesting. Okay. And then the environment variable names as constants. That's good. No magic strings. Good to see. Type client implementation. It's a struct. C, like C-like struct or kind of like an interface definition in TypeScript or in Java. Gateway, connection, credentials provider. Uh, yeah, allow that. Oh, all the errors have gone. Good. Must have needed to load like the, um, I don't know, IntelliSense or whatever it's called in here. Client config, another struct. A gateway address, whether or not to use a plain text connection, and then a custom certificate path. If you're connecting to your own SSL um, using your own, I don't know, self-signed certificate, Credentials provider, a credentials provider. Keep Alive can be used to configure how often Keep Alive messages should be sent to the gateway. These will be sent whether or not there are active requests. Negative values will result in error, and zero will result in the default of 45 seconds being used. Okay, so it's optional. Keep Alive. Dial opts. That's interesting. I wonder if I can go to definition. Go to. Go to um, declarational usages implementation. Dial option. Okay. Go to declaration. Okay, it's a struct. So you can, okay, so you can provide some pretty low level configuration to this client by the look of it. Yeah, okay. A health check function, that's interesting. Health check function, interesting. Wonder if the, Java, the JavaScript client can take a health check function. Default service configuration, okay. 
default service config raw json resolve now back off to function this is used by CC Resolver Wrapper to back off between successive calls to resolve a resolve now. The user will have no need to configure this, but we need to be able to configure this in tests. Interesting. Resolvers with proxy, yes or no? Call options. Okay, interesting. Uh, uh, okay, that's cool. It's an error as a constant. No way for them to put the um, file name into the error, though, doing it this way. Type error, string, function, error. Takes an error, returns a string. Cast the error to a string and return it. Okay. Client implementation, a new topology command. Okay. Returns a topology command. So inject the client into it. Okay, it's a functional kind of interface or implementation. Return commands, new topology command. Pass in the gateway from the implementation, the credentials provider, whether it should retry the request or not. Okay, so these are the different gRPC API commands. Dun. Let's have a look at these commands. Go to implementation. Click on there. Go to implementations. Okay. Dun, dun, dun. Import. Okay, so <clears throat> it, imp it imports a package with the commands in it. Okay, that's an interesting syntax. I'm not like a daily programmer in uh, in Go. So let's just pick one, like activate jobs. Where do we see that? New activate jobs command. Commands new activate jobs command. What happens if I try to go to the implementation of this? Takes me to yeah, activate jobs or go. Okay, so yeah, so. The way Go works is if you name something with a capital letter on a function, it exports it, makes it visible outside of the file. Okay, and it uses the builder pattern just like the Java client does. Okay, here's where we create a new client. What might be interesting actually is to put beside this the uh, the go getting started guide. I have one that I wrote a little while ago that we can look at. Uh, uh, uh. Nope, not that one. This one, documentation. Come on to Cloud Docs. Um, get started, and then. Go. Okay. Set up. Here we go. Okay. So the main function of our getting started example. First thing we do is get the client. Okay. That returns a ZBC client. And to construct the client, we get a gateway address. And then we call new client to get a ZB client, and then we return that, okay? So we call this new client here. Takes a client config, apply client environment overrides. That's right, I remember because when I wrote this, I, I think I had to do this, and then I wrote a patch, I opened a, an, an issue, and wrote a patch so that it does it automatically now. So that's out of date. But let's have a look at this. Um, go to implementations. It's in the same file. It's lowercase, so it's not exported. Okay, apply client environment override. So you pass in any explicit configuration that was passed to the function 
new client. Uh, uh, uh. <clears throat> okay, this is an interesting syntax. Looks like it is a assignment and a uh, conditional at the same time. Interesting way to do it. Um, I think you can do this in JavaScript as well, but it's an error because it will always evaluate to void. Or will it? Or will it? Uh, or does it evaluate to true? Let's open a terminal and find out. <clears throat> I, I spent like about 15 minutes trying to trace down a bug, and it was because I put a single equals in a, in a conditional in JavaScript in Node. So I can do, um, if I do let A, and if I say, if A equals true, see what this returns. Cons uh, let me first of all test the value of A. And I can say this, if A equals true, console.log, it's true. Yes, like that, boom. Okay, interesting. Okay, so it does the assignment first and then it evaluates it. Mm. A equals false. Defined. Okay. So if I go, see what happens if I say if B. Value of B, false. Yeah. Okay. So this is like more like comparing language syntaxes, actually. This one here. You can do this in JavaScript, but what you can see happened here in, in JS when I did it is that it, it silently initialized a variable called B and then assigned the value false. Whereas here in Go, in order to, um, in order to define, oh, let me turn this thing into do not disturb mode. Do not disturb. Okay. Yeah, in order to do this, um, I don't know, I, I, might, I might call it a side effect assignment in a conditional. Um, it's like a, it's a declaration and an assignment and a comparison. But in order to do it in Go with an undeclared variable, you have to use this syntax here, which is colon equals. Pascal uses colon equals for assignment and then equals for comparison. Here you can see it's just a single equals, and this means that whatever's on the left side of that operator must be already defined, but colon equals is a definition, a, a declaration and an assignment. So if insecure con equals, you know, get the insecure environment variable value from the environment, I initialized it, and if it is not empty, then assign it to the config. No, don't assign it to the config. Evaluate this Boolean condition. So if it's equal to true, then use it. Um, okay. I, I, when I, whenever I write these ones here, I always use like to lowercase or to uppercase to make them case insensitive. But this is obviously case sensitive. Similar thing for the CA certificate path, the gateway address. I think this is the thing here that we, we added with that um, issue in the pull request that I opened. Okay, if val equals env keep alive environment variable, if it's not null or empty, keep alive equals string convert parse to integer base 10 bit size 64 epic. If error is not equal to nil, then okay. Print an error. That's cool. <clears throat> Does it throw? 
Okay, it looks like it does throw, and that's what this indicates. Keep alive equals the time duration keep alive times time millisecond. Okay. I'm not sure what that just did. Okay, so can I go back? I don't know if I can. Nope. Anyway, uh, new client. Let's find it by scrolling through. These are all the different commands. New client. We create a new client. GRPC with user agent. Oh, that's interesting. There's an open issue in the node client to um, normalize the user agent string. So I had a request from one of the engineers from Chris Zeldin to add a user agent string to the node client. So I did that. Um, open actually as a Hacktoberfest um, task. So if somebody wants to pick it up, oh, hey, Falco's here. You know, let's see if I can add him in. <laughs> add to stream. Hey, how long have you been waiting for? Uh, a while. <laughs> it's kind of when you already yeah. go online, you're, you're get difficult to get your attention. Yeah, fully into it. Yeah, but that's all I right. I can't see myself now. I can only see um, my screen. Hmm. Oh, yeah, I know yeah. why. Yeah, because... You need to change the layout. This. No, I, I was sharing no. my screen using my virtual camera. Mm -hmm. Epic. Thanks for joining so early in the morning. It's like 6 o'clock, eh? In Berlin. Yep, six six twenty in Berlin. Still dark outside. Huh. It's coming into winter there, right? Mm-hmm. Unlike yeah. where you are. Good summer here. Daylight savings. It's light till eight o'clock at night. Summer is on its way. <laughs> yeah, it's a different world. Different part of the world, really. Yeah. As opposite side as it can be. Yes. So how would you like to uh, how would you like to roll with this? Uh, I'm actually happy for you to um, continue what you're doing there. It looked quite promising already. Okay. Good to know. Good to know. <clears throat> Let me try this then. Um, I think I can. Let's try doing share screen. See if this works. Um, screen sharing is easiest with two monitors. Check screen sharing works best on a good computer, the best computer. Um, Share screen. And then I want to share this one. Share. Oh, look at that. Beautiful. And Fantastic. by the way, you, you might not need to share your name in the virtual camera because StreamYard already shows your name. Right. Goodbye. <laughs> Here we go. Topic. Um, I might leave that running. But I should change it because it says Node.js client. And in fact, it is not right now. <clears throat> right now, it is ZB Go client deep dive. Deep dive. Like that. And maybe make it a little bit bigger and say, yes, make it so. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Can you smell what the rock is cooking? Uh, uh, gRPC with user agent. I wonder if I can do that in the node client as well instead of manually adding it. I'll look into that later. And then we get a connection back. And then we return a struct, which has a gateway, a connection, and a creden credentials provider in it. So here, I can say uh, hide this thing, get status. Oh yeah, this is interesting. Um, in order to do asynchronous stuff in, um, in Go, I've got to grab this context. Because Go, of course, doesn't have, um, it's single threaded, but it doesn't have an event loop and it uses Go routines, co-routines. Go routines, both of them. Have you done? Have you done much programming in Go? Any? 
Um, not really. Uh, I guess the most I've done was looking into some client examples for ZB. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much for me, it's been, um, oh, I actually wrote my very first proof of concept for ZB in Go. Maybe about two, two and a half years ago. And then I went back to the team and I was like, guys, this is our opportunity to write Go. And they were like, it's like a six person team, all Node.js, you know? And they're all like, no. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? This is the future. And uh, that's how I ended up writing the Node client. Because <laughs> they didn't want to switch to Go. So get status, um, yeah, context background, and then this new topology command. So the new topology command is uh, back up here. Dun, dun, dun. New topology command. And, okay, it's funny. These can be null. No, these cannot be null. <clears throat> So this must get assembled somewhere. This is kind of like a, it's kind of like a um, method on an object or a, or a, a, yeah, a class instance. But you have to, in, you have to inject the um, object into it. So where does that happen? New client. returns a client or an error return okay but it actually never returns an error um or oh okay okay it expands it out okay so it's got a branch there And, and, and. But somehow this thing gets assembled. It's a function that takes a client implementation. This returns a client implementation. There's, this is an interesting, um, it's a lot of Go is uh, by convention. Like they made it strongly opinionated in like one way to do everything because they wanted to make a language where they could get graduates from university using it straight away and not wasting any time on like tabs versus spaces. So they were like, we're going to have one canonical way to format source code for the entire planet. <laughs> and then they wrote a formatter for it. Well, I think that was a smart move. Yeah. Which do you prefer, tabs or spaces? <laughs> uh, no, I'm in the spaces camp. Two to four. Okay. Not not hundred percent decided there. <laughs> yeah, I was kind of like, um, I mean, in the JavaScript world, they seem to have like normalized on two spaces. At least some a large percentage of people. But I remember I asked the JBoss developer and he said to me, I prefer tabs because it means anybody viewing the source code can set the uh, spacing to whatever they want it to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is definitely that argument. Somehow this, um, somehow this returns a, uh, an object that has these methods on it but I can't see how it gets wired. So it returns this client implementation struct. But then when, when I actually get it back here, ZB client, it just has a new topology command on it as a method. But in the actual source code itself, it just returns this struct 
And then in this definition here, it has the methods themselves, but there's no, it must just be by convention then that these get wired onto it. Okay. This must be how you create like the equivalent of an object of a, of a, yeah, this must be like the equivalent of a class. So let's have a look at the topology command. Uh, go to the implementation. Here we go. So this is in, yep, it's in the package commands. It's a struct. It has one member command. New topology command. So it returns a topology command. Command. Retry predicate. That retry predicate that we saw in the Java client the other day, was that only used for getting the credentials? If I remember correctly. Do you remember that? Yeah, that was it. That was it. So it returns. It would do this uh, thing like if your token expired, it would get you a new token and retry that. Right. Yeah. Or basically, it would retry the command that you were sending, um, and after it gets the token, the, yeah, and, and getting a new token on the way. I wonder if I handle that case in the node client. So a new topology command, and then there's this um, ampersand, and then this uh, asterisk. I think this has got something to do with a, um, this is like a constructor here when you put the ampersand on. It's a type safe. So basically it's kind of like in JavaScript, you just write a JSON object, but this here makes it type safe by specifying what type it is. And I think that this asterisk means it's like a pointer. Takes a command. Do you know if go does pass by reference or pass by value? Mm, not sure. I think that, that the use of the asterisk is like um, how you control that. Uh, pass by pointer versus pass by value. There is no pass by reference in Go, according to that headline. Well, pass by pointer is kind of that, right? OK, so you can pass by pointers and by values. Passing by value, just pass this thing in. OK, and then pass by, yeah, OK, so that's pass by pointer. Mm -hmm. Pass by value often is cheaper. Okay. I, I would have thought pass by value would be more expensive because wouldn't you have to like copy it? Escape analysis to determine a variable can be safely allocated on function stack frame. Okay. So we call this thing here. Uh, it returns a pointer to a topology command. So then we return this uh, new topology command. And then when we call send on that thing, CMD, it looks like it looks like the way Go works is if I put a function in here and then I have a um, an anonymous function, and then I put a single parameter on it, which is the it's pointer not even a to. It's it's just really saying what it works on because the parameters are configured <clears throat> afterwards, right? The the send here configures that it has a context parameter. It does, yeah. I guess I'm I was kind of thinking of it like a curried function. You know, like you pass in this 
CMD and you get back a function called send, but it, it probably doesn't imperatively evaluate like that. Okay, so it's a syntax where this is how you specify that it's a method of uh, whatever this thing returns. Mm -hmm. Send takes this context and then it returns a pointer to a topology response or an error. And then you just run this thing here with the context. And then response error, if command should retry, context error, return. Okay, well, what does this should retry thing look like? Oh, the predicate. Oh, okay, so it runs the predicate function. <clears throat> runs the predicate function, and if it evaluates the true, then what? It reruns it again. Yeah, that's the idea, right? You do, uh, the predicate tells you whether you should, you know, whether the, the error that you got indicates that a retry makes sense because it was an error that uh, was just by an expired token so yeah basically that if it if it was this token problem then it tells you to retry and then um you simply redo what you try to do and uh, on the way you will get a new token so it looks like it calls the retry predicate every time and that that retry predicate takes a context and an error so yeah and i guess if if there is no uh, if there's no error, then the should retry will ignore your invocation. We'll probably do that as well. It doesn't, it, let's have a look. Where's this retry predicate in here? Yeah, there should be multiple implementations. So here's the client config. Uh, where's the retry? It's the constructor, new client, dial opt. <clears throat> Where does that thing actually get? Can you search? I probably could. Retry. So search for. So it's in the credentials provider. Mm -hmm. uh, go to implementation. Yep. Go to declaration, implementation. Yeah, that's why it's multiple implementations. Right. Nothing. Return false. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Interesting would be more what the what the OAuth version is doing. Yeah. So. I would assume that that checks first of all if your error is really an error. If it's like a token error, right? And then checks what type of error it is exactly. If you don't have an error, then you shouldn't retry. Should retry request takes context and error. It's a mm. status code. Okay, equals codes unauthenticated. Update the credentials. If you can't get them, sorry, but bow. Otherwise, yeah. return the updated credentials. Um, otherwise, return false. It's not an error that I should be handling. Okay. Exactly. <clears throat> That's probably exactly. So then this gets you new credentials and then the, the, the other code that we looked at will just retry the same command knowing that the credential problem has been resolved if there was any. And yes. in any other exception, any other error, it would just not retry because it's not retryable. Um, yeah, it should maybe be 
called something else then, right? Because it, it does sound like a generic retry, but it's only on a specific. It's only related to the um, authentication credentials. The other thing that's interesting here is that, what is this? Okay, so you update the credentials and then they either update it or they didn't. It's a Boolean. Let's have a look. Go to implementation. Update credentials. Context with timeout. Defer. Cancel. Uh, uh, client equals get an HTTP client. Okay, yep. Context with value. Get a token. If there's no error, no, if there's no error, then here. So you can return either true or false. So you can you could actually get an error, or I wonder if this case ever actually happens where you just get back no token. Hmm. Okay, yeah, but if the, if, the, if the authentication provider is not, if the token provider is somehow down, then that could happen, right? But then you would get an error in the token. That's what I was thinking. You get an error, right? In that case. No, no I think uh, that was because then that thing returned false. Right, returns it returns false and an error. Mm -hmm. Else, if the P token is nil. Or the token's not valid. Or if the token access token, P token, does not equal this. Wouldn't this erase your token, though? Like if you get back a token that's nil, or if the token is invalid. Then it's going to retry. Like that token that comes back, I mean, if we just take, because this will be the, the OAuth credentials provider that's used for Kamunda Cloud, concrete instance. I mean, if it returns a nil token, there's no way that your command will ever actually work, right? Yeah, it sounds a little weird. And if the token's invalid, it's definitely not going to work. But then it tests here and says, you know. Well, hang on a second, if, it's testing. P token, right? And the token we just received is is uh, token. <clears throat> right. Okay. So yeah. Okay. If we don't already have a token, or if the token that we already have is not valid, or if the token that we just got back is different from the token that we have, so those are the three cases where yeah. we need to update the token and then retry. Okay. So if you get the same token back, then it doesn't retry. It's like, Excellent. yeah, okay. That's, that's, that's smart. I probably would, um, for comprehensibility, um, extract those into named constants, right? But I guess if you're working with the code base all the time, you just like, it's obvious. Dun, dun, dun. Let's get out of here. The, the credentials provider is kind of necessary evil, but not the most interesting part to look at for the client. Yeah, what do you think is the most interesting part? I would all again be curious of the job ex the job acquisition and seeing how that is handled, especially the streaming part of it that we looked at in the Java client. Mm. So that's going to be an activate jobs. .go. Well, hang on, let's have a look at the construction of the worker first, hey? Yeah, let's let's go through the initialization to see how things are set up and then 
Well, that's basically it. You get that client back. I think in the Go client, you have to create the worker separately. Let's have a look. Create a BPMN model, create a workflow instance, view, create a job worker. So there's the handler. Get the client. Yep. Oh, no. You call new job worker. Yeah, and it uses the builder pattern, just like the Java client does. So if we go back to the client, then we'll find somewhere in here, new job worker. Here it is. And so that returns a builder, new job worker builder, passes in the gateway and the client. So go to implementation. I wonder if these defaults are the same. Let's have a look. They probably will be. A 32 default max job active, same. Default job worker concurrency, that's different though, right? Mm -hmm. 100 millisecond timeout, that's the same. Worker pole threshold, 0 0.3, that's the same. That's the amount of uh, available capacity. You know, what's interesting is that the C-sharp client has got that set to 0 0.6. <laughs> Either that or when Chris was describing it to this user, he was describing it the other way around. It was in, in an issue in the C-sharp client. Yeah, it's also named quite a slightly different, so we have to double check if it's doing the same thing. But it mm. sounds like... Okay, get back your builder. You got your builder steps. It's pretty much the same as the... Uh, Oh, this is interesting. Metrics. What's this? This is not in the... Set the maximum amount of concurrent spawned Go routines. That's pretty cool. Um, so that's a little bit different, but this is kind of like the thread pooling, right? Mm -hmm. um, but this is different. Metrics. Let's find out what a metrics is. Implementation. No implementations found. Go to the declaration at least. Nothing. No, no, no. Job worker metrics. Metric is the local name. Oh, okay. It's the other way around. Right. So I guess this is just like it's running capacity or running, not capacity, but load how many jobs it's got mm -hmm. to work on at any point in time. That's pretty cool. I would wish the Java client would have something like that. Um, cause for a um, yeah, current project that I'm working on, I'm, I'd be interested to see how the utilization of the worker is. Yeah, this is an interface. So you basically pass in something that has a set jobs remaining count method on it, and it must get called at some scheduled interval, right? So that you can put whatever you want into there, like Prometheus or console.log, mm -hmm. CSV can we file. See of it? Well, there was a um there was a mock one, right? Let's have a look. Go to implementation. Mock job worker metrics. Mock recorder. Return a mock. Let's see where it gets actually used. So if it returns a job builder, worker builder, step three, it must mean that it's on step two in here? Step no. Three. It's in no, step it's three. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is a, yeah, okay, yeah. So go to the implementation. Metrics, there it is. It's a type. Okay, step three interface um, timeout 
metrics, 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 concurrency, poll threshold, fetch variables, metrics, builder.metrics, okay. So al final, it's going to do, this is the thing here where it assembles everything. Voltron assemble. Puts it in here. Close signal. Worker finish. Job queue. Metrics. Threshold. Int. Math round. Float 64. <laughs> wow. Build a max job actives multiplied by the poll threshold. Okay. Uh, like in the Java client. Yeah. And here is it. Is it exposed as a very as a configuration parameter or is it just the default now i guess it's exposed right mm, let's have a look if it was exposed it would be interface poll threshold it. yeah it's here yep you can set it mm -hmm. it wasn't exposed in the java client was it until you until you created the um pull request yeah but that now uh, would make me think if our entire half an hour variable discussion <laughs> was <laughs> finding the right outcome. If I mean, if the Go client already has a name for it, maybe that could <laughs> change be their name to it. Yeah, I, I kind of like the oh. shortness of it, and the polling poll threshold kind of means something. Okay, it's something regarding polling. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of cool, but you know. The other one's Java, so it needs an enterprise name. This is Go. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I, I, I say we made the right call on that one. I see. I, I mean, you know, if we put a factory, it would have been the only other way to make it even better. Mm. <laughs> yeah, throw some more design patterns on top. Exactly. A bean... Corba. Um, okay, well, let's. I, I, I'm interested to know where this metrics thing gets called. Okay, so it spawns a Go routine that has the polar in it, and it spa spawns another Go routine with a dispatcher. That's pretty cool. Passes the job queue. Okay, so this this is interesting so the here we go okay create some channels a job queue worker finished close polar close dispatcher bar close weight sync weight group So it creates these channels between go routines. Close weight add. I don't know what that does. Add delta to the weight group counter. Mm, add panics. Mm, okay. But it looks like it has a polar and a dispatcher. Yep, and it spawns them into their go routines and it returns a controller so it looks like there's no there's no way okay this is why it has to have a metrics counter on it because there's no way to interact with it otherwise it, ha it has three methods that you can call uh, and that's it you can't actually access anything because it's all kind of distributed in different maybe threads mm-hmm go routines which one do you want to look at now the dispatcher or the polar polar let's start with the polar right that must be the first one that did gets interaction okay. go to the implementation okay it's in job polar which is in okay it's all in this worker directory Okay, so a PB gateway. What does PB stand for? There's a whole section here of PB. Gateway.pb. What do you reckon PB stands for? Let's close some of these windows. Close all to the right. 
uh, protocol, protocol buffers, obviously. Right. Yes. Okay. So, so the implementation of it, of the protocol. Yeah. Okay. So they have to write an entire. This is mm -hmm. maybe generated code. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, you don't have to do this in the JavaScript client. I just copy the protocol, you know, the .proto file into the project, and it auto-generates. Uh, okay, so we get the gateway client, PV. PV, yep, PV, .gateway client. So it's not actually a protocol buffer. It's like a concrete, it's a concrete implementation of it. Yeah, it's probably the entire yeah gateway client implementation in there with all oh. the protocol messages and ways to send it and stuff. Yeah, okay. I can, I have, I can live with the, that being a client. Let's see how this is used. So one thing yeah. we see also is that we have then the uh, activate jobs requests. Um, this might be worth looking into for just mm. a second to see what kind of structure we are having there. So oh, interesting. Okay, so this is. I don't. Have you seen this syntax before? So you can take a. Um, you can create a struct, and then, you know, you got like a member of the struct. It's type, and then this kind of template string in the back ticks here. You can specify the serialization of it. So if it's being serialized to protobuf, you specify how it gets serialized to protobuf. And if it's been serialized to JSON, you can specify it's this is the key. And then like omit empty means you don't get an undefined on the JSON object if it's not set. Yeah. Got it. Okay. That, okay. So this is pretty cool. They can serialize. So from this, you could serialize to JSON or to protobuf. That's a that's a I think that's a handy feature in Go that I would like to see in other languages. Now in Time. Java, we only put annotations there. Right, and use like Jackson or something. Yeah, that will be one of the typical implementations for JSON at least, um, and for other serializations too. Quest timeout, max jobs, job da, 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 metrics. Job polar poll. Okay, so defer this. Polar activate jobs. Polar poll. Okay, but this is not the the loop. This is the actual activation itself. Where's the polar loops? Uh, activate jobs. Set jobs remaining count metric. Okay, so. Oh, no, it did. It called polar.pol, didn't it, in the job worker builder right here. Yeah, that's it. this is what kicks it off. So it basically kicks this off into another th go routine, another thread. Yeah, Pol. and it's uh, at this point not scheduled for anything. Um, it just straight up polls, right? Yeah, there's probably some delay later here, but let's just go into activate jobs for now. Okay. Let's yeah, there we go. Initial poll. Uh, go to implementation. Context with timeout. This is kind of a bit like you have to manage this yourself. It's kind of weird. Polar request max jobs to activate. Okay. Max jobs active minus remaining okay so remaining means how many we still have to execute stream okay we get back the stream if there's an error um okay so this is a for loop with no condition on it <laughs> this is like forever interesting syntax well you have to break in there right yeah but 
I agree. It's a little it's like well true. <laughs> if you come from JavaScript or Java, then this is a little bit different from what we are used to. Um, yeah. So we just receive from here. If it's not an error. So basically, I guess this is kind of like waiting on the stream, right? So it's blocking. It's a blocking call. But that break is... Okay, no. So we, we block until we get something on the stream, and then we get something on the stream. Yeah, okay. So it looks like this client as well gets the complete set of jobs back all at once. So the streaming, you know, when we looked at the gateway code, did it look like it was streaming all the jobs at once or it was streaming them back as it got them? Do you remember? Well, um, it looked like you would have multiple response messages coming in. In the stream. So the underlying gRPC library must handle it, hey? On the client. Could you have a look at the receive method? Yeah. Either docs or implementation. Yeah, straight to the source code. Now we see that this gets called with an activate jobs response message. And that message can contain multiple jobs, but you can receive multiple of those messages through the stream and can yeah. you that was at least how how the java implementation felt and also how the gateway looked okay because here it this is basically the whole activate jobs is like it's got one stream receive and then in a loop, right? So it'll do this and then go back to here, but then, oh yeah, okay, yeah, it does. Until. We are getting AOF. If error does not equal L. Okay, so EOF is, is an error. That's weird. Would you expect EOF to be thrown as an error? Uh, well, I guess you have to get it out somehow, right? <laughs> it's yeah. weird that it's an error, though, semantically. Break, Not and then boom, we're out. OK, yeah, so this, this thing is listening on a stream, and it's getting them one after the other. Yeah, one you know, response message after the other. And then a response itself can contain multiple jobs. And that's probably what we see here then in the yeah. I-96. Yep. We are checking Plus how much stuff we got. That's pretty similar to the code in the Java client. OK, so and there is your metric. There's the metric. It's um, reactive. So it's not on a time period or an interval. It's actually every time you receive. So, okay. Metric changes. Makes sense. Well, it's, well, yeah, it might get called somewhere else and when, we, when we decrement because we have to, when we complete a job also, that changes. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. For underscore job error, that would be the error, equals range response jobs. In other words, response jobs for each. And then we pipe it to the other over this channel into there. This is kind of cool how this works, like these go routines and channels. So you can set up a channel and then basically it's uh, this is a, a variable in the other go routine. So you stream that entity, the job across. Mm -hmm. Then and then and then that will trigger something in the um, dispatcher. 
Is that where it's going to? Polar job queue. Yeah. How's the, how, do, how do you listen on that then? Channel. So it's a channel. And then it got set up up here, I think. Job queue. Mm -hmm. Max job active is probably the queue length. Yeah, so see, it got passed in here as a as a channel. Mm -hmm. okay. It's kind of like a like a, a stream or a, like an event emitter. So then, if we have a look at the job dispatcher, let's go here. Go to implementation. Dun, dun, dun. Work queue. Worker queue. Wow, okay. So what is this? Make Chan Chan. Has the variable been named with the same name as the no? Chan. Struct. Well, you pass a channel into the channel. Hmm. It's weird. No idea. Type size integer type. A new object or channel. First argument's a type. Yep. Return type is the same type of argument, not a pointer to it. Whatever. Um, okay, for i equals zero, I recognize this syntax. It's just missing uh, bre um, parentheses. i is less than concurrency, i plus plus. Okay, uh, this Chan Chan thing means that uh, a response queue or a response channel is passed as a, as a value into the request channel of that go routine. Okay, so you can do two-way communication. Yeah, or basically you're transporting a channel through another channel. Oh, epic, inception. This is kind of, yeah, a, a callback channel, so to say. Right. That is also sent over a channel. Okay. And then... So this is the number of like, this is the thread pool. So we basically create a number of go routines for the threads. And then it runs in an infinite loop, listening for work. Where does that work get defined? Oh, here. So it makes a channel that can take one job at a time. So this kind of basically just is synchronously waiting on something to appear on that channel. No, work queue. Oh, where, where? oh, this is the channel that it's passing into here. So it makes a channel here and passes it into this thing. Mm -hmm. Into the worker queue. And then, hmm. how does this get wired into the job polar? This thing has a job queue. 
Yeah, we need to see where it, it's reading the job queue. Well, this is where it reads. Oh, the, this is where it reads its worker queue. But yeah, where's the job queue? Loop. Here we go. Uh -huh. uh, okay, so. Yep. Wait for a job from the job queue, and then. We got a job. Yep. Case worker equals. What? Job. So you're reading from the worker queue? Yeah, that's weird, huh? I'll wait for a worker. Oh, what? The worker passes itself into the worker queue. Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's a, the worker queue is a, um, Oh, I see. Yeah, because what's happening here is that this job polar is a singleton running in its own thread space or whatever and with a channel to talk to the job dispatcher. But the job dispatcher can create n number of like workers. And so it needs to create a channel for each of the workers to be able to send work to it. Mm -hmm. And so what the workers do is they pass their a channel to themselves into the worker queue. That's what the Chan Chan thing is. Mm -hmm. That's how it dynamically spawns N workers and wires them up to the dispatcher. So that means when you get an entry in the worker queue, that means a worker is available to accept jobs. Yes. And, and that is signaled by the entry being a, a channel. And then you just throw the job into that channel that you receive yeah. worker queue. Wow, this is like this is alien technology, man. <laughs> <laughs> Who came up with this? Funny syntax, definitely. Even the architectural pattern is like I like if if you had asked me to design this. And I had to like read the go docs and everything. I wouldn't have come up with this way, but this is quite elegant passing around channels and then, you know, having them in a queue. It's smart. Yeah. I like it. I'm getting some ideas for the node client here. <laughs> Wait for the worker or the close signal. Yeah. I guess what we've seen in a Java client was a lot of, using certain um, library functions to enable uh, a thread pool and then have some communication among them. Using and atomics, now, right? No, that wasn't even atomics. That was just JDK um, executors. So this was just a normal um, standard library. But the, uh, they were using like atomic integers and stuff. Yeah, that's true. That's then also for to have thread safe variables and you know have a way to communicate. And here you have a natural native construct for for queuing inside uh, queuing and message passing really mm. inside the inside the core language. Core library. Yeah. And not even the core library. This is the language itself. Mm first class concept of a go routine in a channel. Exactly. So where yeah. does the Just amount of the, those things are not actually threads, but something more compact than that. So it runs more efficiently than an operating system thread like Java. Yeah. Would be and then where does the handler job dispatcher work finished send true into there dispatcher work finished so there's a a listener on this work finished somewhere yeah let's look at the worker code itself okay unless that's not only just set up here you know one thing i find 
um, challenging with this style because in the Node.js client, I use something similar, which is like emit and on. It's just like this kind of like way of wiring it up <laughs> makes it difficult to navigate through the code base and find out where things talk to each other, you know, with like go to like all method calls of this method. Mm -hmm. This is like very different. Uh, job worker. So I think the the worker is actually right there. Just does close and wait close. I mean, basically, this is it, hey? Handler passing the client and the job. It's yeah, the, the, the worker loop that we see here. That's that's all of it. Just gets handed in. So run in here, the builder.handler, a job handler. This doesn't look like it. Well, hang on. Let's have a look. The dispatcher. And then so the worker loop is here. This handler gets called. What happens if this throws? Um, well, the return well, type is hard, it seems. Yeah, let's have a look at its definition. Go to implementation. Yeah. It returns void by the look of it. Mm -hmm. So it looks like this doesn't handle exceptions in the handler unless there's some language kind of level thing. Well, maybe the handler is simply responsible to handle uh, any errors and just push them into the feedback. Which means that if you have a misbehaving handler, like the code is badly written, doesn't deal with some particular case that it runs into at runtime, you could exhaust your capacity, couldn't you? Let's have a look for this. That was one thing that I had with the... Um, Declarational usages, job dispatcher, worker finished. Job dispatcher, worker finished. Where does that get created? Where does dispatcher get passed in? Let's have a look. Go to. Well, dispatcher is the struct, right? Well, it, no, it, it's it's a channel because it's passing in, passes in true, like, okay, this is done. Go to the implementation. This thing here. Uh, this is the this in other programming languages. Yes. Yeah, Features. yeah, it would be easier if it was this. So where is that worker finished? Uh, where is it assigned? Well, that will just be another method or another function defined for the dispatcher. This is it. Or I know it's a parameter in the struct you see there. That's got a job queue, worker finished. So the call or uh, run. So in here, where it gets constructed, open. So in the open method. Okay, so it makes a channel and passes it in. And the job polar. Okay, so the job polar must be listening on that channel, like, okay, it just got done. Okay, here. So we run activate jobs. It gets the jobs back. It punches them through to the dispatcher for this job queue. Sets the remaining count. And then after it does that, activate jobs. Um, select. Okay, that's interesting. Pass the code 
otherwise the screen sharing doesn't follow. So yeah, after it activates the jobs, it then moves into here for select case. So switch case, switch on what? Oh, okay. So, oh, this is interesting syntax. You can just like wait on different uh, channels. Yeah, this is an event-based gateway. Ah, <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. So if the worker is finished, decrement. Okay, so then it sets the remaining metrics. Mm -hmm. And then after the polar interview, nothing. And this is just an infinite loop. Okay, yeah, that's interesting because, of course, well... Yeah, okay. Hmm. So what does this do then? It four. Yeah, okay. It waits. Okay, if this if this thing fires, then it checks whether it should activate more jobs. And if yeah. it should, it does. Otherwise it loops back and waits longer. Okay. And any of the others? I mean, okay, the last one returns, right? So that jumps out of the function Holding. here. Mm. Uh, but time after is kind of nah, not really blocking, right? But what's well, a time? It's a it's an interrupting it's timer time boundary event. event. You receive that interrupt, then the case doesn't do anything, but you then continue with the code underneath. I guess. Yes. Yeah. Okay, this is elegant. Yeah. So of course, yeah, you go into that loop, and whatever comes first lets you get uh, lets you. The loop itself or the select is blocking and it can be waking up by multiple events. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it is blocking, but it's the select. It's not the individual case statement. That's exactly an event-based gateway. It's super easy to understand if you know BPMN. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which presumably a lot of people using ZB will or are and, about to. And, Sometimes I explain BPMN to developers by using programming language constructs, but obviously the event-based gateway never really had any programming language direct relative. Right. Now it, <laughs> and now it does. You can be like, it's kind of like a select statement in Go, you know, where each case is listening on a channel. And then they're like, I've never used Go. And you're like, well, okay. <laughs> in that case, there's nothing like it. should activate jobs if the polar remaining is less than the polar threshold go ahead and do it yeah that's that sounds almost literally ported over from the java code yeah okay so that's basically the whole thing there but the only thing that remains unresolved for me is what happens in the case where this handler throws Well, no, uh, maybe you can't throw in, um, in Go. Maybe it doesn't throw. It must throw. Mm, arrows were usually returns, right? They are, but what happens if you get a panic? I guess it either panics or if you don't handle it, your whole application could panic. Yeah, right. Yeah, it doesn't really, it, yeah, it doesn't really, it's not a throwing language, is it? It's more a return and either, returns and either, either a result or an error, and then you've got to manage it. So I guess, yeah, by design, handlers can't really throw, but they, but what happens if you, I guess, yeah, I guess the, the, the compiler actually doesn't let you write code that doesn't have an error path in it. No, you can. I remember when I did my um, proof of concept, you can put an underscore where the error is and just ignore it. In which case, anyway. Is it really this safe? 
Or could I write a handler that could throw at runtime? No, I just search a little bit for it. And for then which? It says, uh, Go solves the, extent, the exception problem by not having exceptions. Instead, Go allows functions to return an error type in addition to a result via its support for multiple return values. Okay. So I guess you're... Um... But what happens if I do this? What happens if in my code I say, read this file, and I get back an error, and then I try to do like a parse to string on the buffer that comes back from the file, and that returns an error? Okay, yeah, I guess then I get back nil then. Yeah. Interesting. So the only thing that could happen then is... And this can happen in the node and the Java client as well, is that in your handler code, you don't complete the job. Yeah, so you have to explicitly fail the job in there. Whereas the Java and the JavaScript client catch any exception in the handler and then fail the job as a result. But in Go, that's unnecessary. So type safe. Well, that's not type safe, it's um, exception safe. No, yeah, there are no exceptions. So nothing to catch there. Um. One could, of course, implement the, the handler interface in a way, or one could design the handler interface in a way that you have this error return value. And then the client could kind of have the convenience feature to submit the, the, the failures to ZB automatically. Right, so you just have a return. Yeah, but and also- you have a standard signature. That would be good actually, because you could have return, I don't know, a value or a um, error, and then you call either success or failure with the appropriate return value. And then your type checker or your compiler would make sure that you called that return, returned something. Yeah. On the other hand, if you are already returning the error, you might as well also send it to ZB right away. Yeah. And you have to receive the error somehow, uh, you know, from some other call that you did, and then it wouldn't work anyway because there's three returns now. There's also throw BPMN error, job fail, and job complete success. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, and, okay. And that distinction is super important. So just not everything should be handled as a technical problem, or also not as a business problem. So you kind of decide whether that's something the process has to handle or if it's something that you can retry on. Mm. Awesome. That's pretty interesting, hey? Like that was a good, like, um, what a great way to learn a new programming language. <laughs> yeah, especially since this is already using some of the uh, more interesting language mechanics. <laughs> yes some of the like unique features of Go. In, in, in a, one could almost argue that this is a really good, yeah. Way to learn Go. That and that Go's language features hand themselves for- uh, This use case. This use case, yeah. Because we need parallel work um now yeah, we have different components that communicate they need to be they have need to have some way of concurrency and communication so it's pretty cool yeah you know the, the one of the guy tj holloway chuck who wrote like a large amount of the node ecosystem node.js like he wrote express for example he um he left javascript and went over to go and he wrote an article about it and yeah he was saying look you know error handling in javascript is terrible and now it's become very fragmented because previously there was that callback thing where it was error first callbacks like goers would take error result and you would test it and you could write a linter that would check but there's no type safety on that and then 
then they switched it to like the synchronous throwing you know and then then you've got a weight and then you've got promises and now you just got like a big mashup of different kind of paradigms mm -hmm. whereas this has just got one way to do it i actually quite like it i might rewrite the node.js client in uh in go i'm kidding <laughs> <laughs> There's already a Go client. Yeah. Yeah. Forgive me if my emotional reactions are still a little bit sleepy. <laughs> no, I can get it. Okay. Well, hey, um, I don't want to take up too much of your day, and it's the end of the day for me too. Um, so what do you want to do next? Do you want to do this again? Do another deep dive into something? Yeah, let's see if we have a topic. Okay. Let's have a hunt round. I'll turn these into um, blog posts for people who are interested and put them onto the, um, what's that thing called? Um, the blog. That's where you put blog posts. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Awesome. Well, thanks for getting up so early in the morning, brother. Yeah, I was wondering whether we should do this uh, maybe sometime at a at a more like prime time for Europe or morning time for the States, but I guess that would be challenging for you. No, I can make it work. You know, it's just scheduling. No, I need to look at time zones because from europe i assume nobody would join something like this live at this time of the day mm. only the most committed <laughs> prime time in europe what do you reckon lunch time we could do like a a very tight lunch and learn could call it that lunch and learn with falco and josh yeah that could work or we do it more in the evening Okay. You get up early. And That's like super early. Oh, no, actually, it doesn't have to be. Berlin, let's say if we did it at like evening. Yeah, it could be evening, right? So then it's lunchtime for the US, evening for, for Germany, like 7 a.m. your time? Would that be... Yeah, 8 p.m. Berlin, 7 a.m. Auckland. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good time. Yeah, let's do that. Shoot for 7 a.m., 8 p.m. your time. No, but just basically switching it around. You being sleepy, me being <laughs> in the evening. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, let's do yeah. that. Okay, okay, well, let's see uh, what topics would come, come up during the next weeks, and then we can schedule another session. So next week I'm out of office, so that, that you're on holidays next week. Yeah, indeed, I'm going sailing on the Baltic. Oh, epic! Yeah, let's wow, see. Be great. That's what deals for us here. Yeah. Okay. So then, week after that, we'll do it. Yeah, that could be working. We can schedule it this week, assuming you don't get captured by pirates, Shanghai into a pirate gang, and then <laughs> you know taken on the seven seas for the next 10 years then you'll be back the next week and then we can do it then yeah sounds good awesome cool we'll have a great day and uh have a great trip on the uh on the ocean thanks See you in a couple have of weeks